The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Howdy again, welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today in the studios we have a very special guest and a very special edition of the Heart of Art. We have here a retired station manager of our very own KMUFM. A lot of you might know her, Penny Zent. Something that I didn't know about her is actually that she's a flutist and a very decorated one. She is the artistic director and founder of Brazos Breeze Flute Choir. She is principal flutist at the Brazos Valley Symphony, past president of National Flute Association, artistic director at the International Flute Orchestra. All right, well, I think that's the intro, Penny. So how are you today? I am good. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Of course. I, the honor is all mine. And I had no idea you were a flutist. I've heard so much about you, but I did not know you were a musician. I started off and, and majored in music. And wow. uh, so that's that's how I kind of got here. Hmm. Uh, I started off my career at KMU as development director. So I was wow. in charge of raising all the money uh, for both the radio and the, the TV station. Uh, but down the line, 16 years after I've been here the radio station manager left and it just seemed like a fitting thing because I had a background in classical music and so I moved right in to take over the management of the radio station and of course was very instrumental in helping out with all of the fun drives and everything for both radio and TV um, had been here from the inception of the annual auction lots of things that that we don't do anymore right. uh, but they were very instrumental back in the day so yeah so uh, that's how it all started and uh, being in the, the radio business was something that I never contemplated but it fit right in with my background since right. at that point in time the radio station was primarily classical and jazz and uh, we had news and, and everything else but it just fit right in so right. one of the, the absolute highlights of my life. Awesome. I mean, fundraising is like the hardest part of it. So it's nice that you got that out of the, from the beginning. <laughs> I, yeah, I knew all about that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, so it was whatever we could come up with uh, to uh, raise money and keep the stations going. And so I was, I'm very proud of the job that we did. And right. uh, left the when I retired, we left the good you know good uh, position for the station to be in and and so I walked away with my head up and that's that's always a nice thing yeah I mean we're still here so <laughs> yes it's definitely a good impact that you had here <laughs> definitely all right well one of the reasons why we have you in the studio today is because Brazos Breeze Flute Choir is having their season opener on October 27th and this will be at the Sanctuary at First Methodist Church at 5 p.m. So what can people expect from this concert? Well, this is our, our season opener. And typically, since it's this time of year, we do kind of a Halloween theme. Uh, awesome. Not every piece is uh, Halloween related. All but one have mystical or mythological uh Either titles or, or the history behind them uh, lend themselves to that. So uh, there's everything from um, a piece called Talisman. Uh, there's a classical piece that's very familiar to people, uh, the ballet music from Faust. And, of course, that's all about a contract with the devil, you know? Ooh, yeah, <laughs> fun. <laughs> uh, there's a, another piece. Uh, piece that that is talking about uh, different kinds of moons and you know we've got the wolf moon and you've got the harvest moon and you know mm -hmm. we're going to talk about some other kinds of moons and that also is kind of a, a mythological uh, background to those um, we've got a fun fun piece called spook light and you may not be aware but there is a a myth about Joplin Missouri 
about this mystical orb that appears in the forest. Ooh. Yes, and they call it the spook light. And so it, it's almost become an annual tradition for people to go out and hunt and see if they can they can see the light. Well, Nicole Chamberlain wrote a piece called Spook Light for Flute Choir, and it features different sounds that the flutes can make and they're called extended techniques uh, you probably heard of beatboxing and some of these sounds are are possible by beatboxing flutes and so wow. that's that's one of the pieces so we alternate between making all kinds of fun things like sss and shh and cha and oh, wow. za and those kinds of things in addition to playing regular notes on the flute and they're interspersed in between the flute choir uh, wow. One of the things about the flute choir that a lot of people do not realize is not just sea flutes or even piccolos. We have sea flutes, we have piccolos, we have alto flutes, we have bass flutes, we have contrabass flutes, which is a vertical six-foot instrument uh, that is up, it's got a stand on the bottom of it, sort of like a cello that you can adjust it to your height. But it's heavy. <laughs> it's heavy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we've got all of these different instruments. We're going to have 24 musicians uh, at the concert, and that even includes percussion and an electric bass this time. We're doing a wonderful piece called Joe's Treat, which is a jazz selection uh, that was written in an honor in honor of a guy named Joe. And it's a really fun, fun piece. And uh, that's going to be uh, featuring Daniel Pardo, who is, Daniel is the um, flute professor at Prairie View A&M. Oh, wow. And a fabulous, fabulous musician. And so he's going to be taking the lead on that. So we've just got a lot of fun things, including even a piece called Halloween Dance. So that's how we're going to end the show. Awesome. And costumes are encouraged, right? Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> the, the, the group's going to be decorated up. So oh, that's awesome. That's about <laughs> so we want the audience too. to come and uh, have fun. And it's not required. But if you feel inclined to do that, you bet. And bring the kids. Because we're going to be having, you know, we'll pass out some candy and do all those kinds of stuff. And it's always nice to see the, the kiddos in costumes. And they really get on. You know, they have such a good time with it. That's awesome. That it's fun for the whole family. Yeah, and, and it's free. Yeah, right. That's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's such a range of, of uh, instruments. Um, how did you create this group? I mean, there's people from all over Texas, right? Oh, there's people from all over Texas. This is a professional group. So most of the people are flute professors at universities across the state. There are band directors, uh, choir directors, you name it. They've all got, you know, professional music backgrounds. And they come in. Uh, we rehearse all day on Saturday. And then we come in on Sunday and, and read down the program one more time and then have a concert at 5 o'clock. So it's fast and furious. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, everybody comes in prepared. It's just a whole lot of fun. And they're great musicians. And they, they are so generous by giving of their time to do all of this. The mm -hmm. group's been in existence since 2009. And uh, it, we just played at the National Convention uh, in really? San Antonio. Yeah, awesome. which was our, our second or third time to do that. Wow. Um, so it's it's fun to get them out, and uh, we had a great time, and, and we had so many wonderful things happening, and it people were just excited. They were on their feet and hooping and hollering when it was over. So it was a great <laughs> program. So we're going to try to continue that tradition, and hopefully everybody will really enjoy this program as well. That's amazing. And, I mean, as founder, what led you to create this group? Well, I... Back in 2001, I went to my first uh, national convention and heard a flute choir. When I was in college, this was nothing that was available. Mm -hmm. I mean, hadn't even, you know, had a concept of it. Um, but they have become very popular over the years. And so they are all over the place. Well, I got exposed to that. Then I decided I would audition to be in the professional flute choir at the uh, NFA. was accepted, and I did that straight for 11 years. Uh, just fell in love with it. And then I was invited to go on tour with the International Flute Orchestra, which I have now been asked to take over. I've been doing that since 2019. Right. And um, I've just become absolutely enthralled with it. And the musical selections have become so much better. There was hardly anything. So you found a lot of transcriptions and that kind of stuff. But now people are composing for it uh, just left and right. And wow. so there's so much music to play and so little time. <laughs> I, I mean, I love that they're creating music specifically for the flute. Yes, yes. And and we're not the only ones. The, there's a trombone choir here, actually, at Texas A&M that's part of the, the music program. And Dr. David Wilborn leads 
that group. Uh, there's clarinet choirs. There's, you know, you name it. And as long as there are multiple instruments within that family, and, of course, the flute family, like I said, it's, it's piccolo all the way down to contrabass and even double contras. And uh, there's one called a hyperbass, which you can't pick up. It's like a big Buddha oh, wow. that has to be rolled around. Uh, <laughs> so it just depends on how low you want to go. So we've got the whole flute or, or, or just the whole orchestra covered as far as the range of sounds. Oh, yeah, definitely. So is, do you all have a website for the Brazos Research? We Choir? do not have a website, but okay. we do have a, a Facebook page. Okay. And so you can find out information about us there. Just search out Brazos Breeze Flute Choir. And um, I've still got to go post all the, the stuff about this concert. But we typically give four concerts a year. We'll have another one um, in December, on December the 8th. And then we have one coming up in uh, February and another one uh, scheduled at the end of March. Alrighty, we'll make sure to keep an eye on that on that Facebook page for any other events. And once again, Sunday, October twenty seventh at five p.m. at First Methodist Church. Right? Yes. All right. Thank you, Hector. Of course, of course. All right. Well, I do want to get into your history with music and where you fell in love with music. Uh, so, where were you raised, and was music something you were always interested in? I would. I was um, interested in it. Yes. My first symphony concert that I ever attended was in the second grade in San Antonio, mm. and I was telling somebody the other day, I'll never forget it. It left such a lasting impression on me, uh, and even at that age, I remember the name of the conductor. His name was Victor Alessandro, and really? uh, so it was really exciting. Uh, then in the fourth grade you know they take you through and so I started you know picking up the recorder and that kind of stuff but in the sixth grade uh, one of my friends has started band and she had picked up the flute well she came over to visit me one day and she brought her flute and I'll never forget when she opened up the case I took one look at it and just fell in love it was shiny it was <laughs> yes Love at first sight. I don't love at first sight. <laughs> and so then I just drove my parents crazy until they let me start uh, taking band uh, the following year in the seventh grade. And I never wavered. I was going to major in music and, and do something with it no matter what. And so I've continued all these these many years. Right. And you went to University of Houston, right? Yes. And what was your area of study? Uh Flute performance. Flute performance. Sure flute is. performance. <laughs> yes. Yep. Do you play any other instruments or is it just No, piano? I had to take piano, but I was not very good at it. So I in order to major in music, you have to pass a piano barrier. So that that for me was three years of piano lessons, and I'm sure they were really happy to get me out of there. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I know you chose the flute because of that experience that you had with your friend, but why do you like the flute above any other instrument? Um, there's just something about the sound of it that I really, really love. Uh, there's nothing better, and I was telling somebody, we just had a symphony concert this past weekend. Uh, we were playing some absolutely gorgeous music, and the flute just floated above the orchestra, you know? So it it has such a beautiful sound and, and a a really terrific array of, of different sounds that you can make with the instrument and the depth of it because the low notes are, are nice and rich and then you've got this you know ethereal sound that floats up at the top and uh, just tapering uh, phrases and that kind of stuff and it, it's a challenge but it's one that that I still enjoy uh, I don't think I'll ever master it uh, it's something that I continue to you know to learn and um, have really had a good time teaching and just every aspect of it. Right. Oh, so you, you've also taught? I it? did. I taught for years. Really? Yeah. Okay. Was this with like a, a music school? I, well, I taught here at A&M for, oh, okay, <laughs> for a couple of years. Yeah, I was, awesome. as an adjunct professor. Um, okay. My regular job, obviously, was, was at KAMU. And so this was all outside of that. But I taught privately, uh, worked my way through school teaching private lessons. Wow. at the University of Houston. So every afternoon I would drive someplace and go teach until 10 o'clock at night. So, oh, so your full day was just It booked. was, yes. <laughs> yeah. that was music, the music and more music. Yeah. Yes. All right, you guys, we will be going on a quick break, but do not go anywhere. We will be right back. Support for KAMU is provided by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts. Presenting Ballet X, contemporary ballet that unites artistic innovation with technical excellence to forge new works of athleticism, emotion, and grace. Performing Tuesday, November 5th at 7 p.m. in Rudder Auditorium. 
More information at academyarts.tamu.edu. Well, I mean, I, I'm sure you've had many memorable performances, but which ones stand out for you? Oh, my gosh. Um, I remember one time, uh, and I couldn't tell you exactly when it was, but it was years and years ago, uh, the Brazos Valley Symphony did a performance of the Verdi Requiem. And I remember it being so moving, and the orchestra played so well. Uh, my oboe uh, left arm, the principal oboe's turned around, and he said, boy, I think I want to do that again. And, and I felt the same way. It was just one of those magical experiences that you have. Mm-hmm. And, um, so, and there's just been so many. I mean, um, everybody asks you, you know, well, what's your favorite piece of music? I, I have so many that I couldn't possibly even list them. Right. Uh, if I was going to be on a desert island, I probably would like to take uh, death and, and transfiguration with me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love all genres of music. So uh, jazz, and of course I grew up in, in rock and roll time, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> love all that stuff too. So uh, I just... music has just been so important in my life Um, and I'm not very good at it but I I sing and uh, sing in the church choir been in the Brazos Valley Chorale so uh, have always wanted to support music locally and try to make that you know a better better place for everybody as well so I mean there's just so much to offer here so it's great right yeah you're so involved in the community I mean with so many organizations I I've lost count (laughs) (laughs) Um, what would you say that one needs to be a good flutist what does one need to have well you know so so many people just they'll see uh, someone playing an instrument and they think oh well I just want to go do that it takes hard work. Oh yeah. And so I think dedication um, and and willingness to commit to the time needed because it does not happen overnight. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you hear parents talk about uh, string players when they first begin, and they're scratching across the you know a violin or or a cello or whatever, and the sounds are not all that pretty. Right. Well, it comes with hard work. Unfortunately, I, mean, I learned the French horn in my yeah. parents' home, and that yeah. was hard to hide the yes. sound <laughs> yes yes yeah I have a, a daughter that's a French hornet so oh. yeah so y- you have to be willing to um to spend the time that's necessary mm-hmm. and with practice comes great rewards right and sometimes it comes in baby steps you know you're not going to be able to taper those phrases uh without a lot of work mm-hmm. and you have to be very concentrated on what you're trying to to learn and the instruments have just gotten better and better and better. And so today, if I compare the, the I'm going to call them kids because I'm so much older than they are, <laughs> but that are coming out of, of music schools and conservatories today compared to when I was in school, there's just hardly any comparison. And yeah. it's not that we were bad. It's just that they they are at a different level. And I think it just continues to rise, Yeah, uh, which is really, really exciting. Yeah, like everyone's trying to outdo the previous yeah. generation. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. And boy, are they cutting it. So it's, it's all good. And that's one of the things about being involved with the National uh, Association Association that was so exciting because I had a chance to work with with all of these people and and so now I've got friends of all different generations and and watching them thrive and reinvent themselves because as many people are coming out of music schools there's not enough jobs so they really have to be willing to to do exactly that they have to find a niche and it has to be unique to them so people have have started forming groups that involve dance and and poetry and you name it. I mean, it's all over wow. the place. But something to draw attention to what they are doing and the passion that they have to and present. You have to be innovative. Right? Yes, Changing absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, and this is more about like more of a general question, but what do you think is the power of music that you've dedicated your whole life to? Well, the power of music is is uh, just unbelievable. It can transport you anywhere you want to go, mm-hmm. you know, and music has the power to make you 
sad. It has the power to make you happy. It has the power to give you energy, uh, to make you want to dance, to do all kinds of things. And I think that's the beauty of it, you know. Um, and so people sometimes will say, in fact, I got a message from some someone today and said, I was listening to something and it really made me sad. And I said, well, I can understand that. But at the same time, think about the memories that created that move for you. Mm-hmm. And, and they were good or else they wouldn't still be moving you today, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? And so that's that's the absolute uh, beauty of it. It stays with you. It can elevate you. They've done all kinds of studies about uh, Mozart has the most dramatic effect, and Mozart can create all kinds of, of good things going on, including uh, raising test scores and everything else. It's amazing right. what music can do for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've actually used that statistic to promote our HD2 classical music radio. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. definitely. Um, All right. Well, I do want to touch a little bit on your history here uh, with us at KMU. So how many years did you serve as station manager? Well, I was here for 37 years. And uh, the last, for a while, I was doing both the the development and the station management. So I think I was from 1994 is when I became station manager and I left in 2017. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I started here 2017, <laughs> right when you were at Atlanta. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I know you were also working on midday classics, mm-hmm. classics and their times, and Brazos Arts. I mean, how did you manage all that? I feel like you're such an active person. Well, what did your day look like? It, it was just, it was really fun. So Brazos Arts uh, was a one once a week program. Uh, it ran several times, but I had the pleasure of coordinating all of the guests that were coming up for that and doing the interviews. And so that was really fun. We narrowed it down. So we had a set time every week and people came in and, and they were in 15 minute segments and here we went, right? Yes. Um, so that was I think that one really brought me the most pleasure. Now, having said that, the classics um, and their times was an interesting program because um, a a guy by the name of Bill Harper had moved into the community from Minnesota, and he he had this idea for the show. And it was patterned after a national um, host who had done something tying in uh, classical music with the history. And so Bill wrote the scripts, and it was just amazing because he did such a great job in doing that. And then I chose the music that was going to be featured uh, to tie in with the history. So that was a fun program. We did pre-record those and because it took research and everything. Right. But then uh, Midday Classics, that was live three, three days a week, two-hour programs. Um, and uh, actually it was four because we did um, on Thursdays, we had garden success and some other stuff that we put in so uh, the one day off but uh, the rest of it was every day choosing pieces and it was like okay I try to program these out at least a week so I wouldn't you know be scrambling trying to find stuff but it it got to be really fun because Mark Edwards who was uh, in your position previously Mm -hmm. uh, Mark would come in to do the weather and do live weather updates. And then that started um, off on another string. Mark was just funnier than, than anybody. Oh, yeah. And so anyway. <laughs> Big we, shoes to fill. Definitely. Yeah, we played, we played off of each other really, really well. And he mm. was just hysterical. So the openings to that show kind of became a classic <laughs> into themselves. <laughs> and um, people were always commenting about it. And so he would have something, you know, something off really obscure and off the cuff every day that that he would you know sucker me into to talking about so we had a really good time doing that so it everything that i did was just fun and even the administrative part of it uh, i'm i'm kind of one of these these people that um enjoys digging into things and so even when i had to do uh all of these federal reports and all this kind of stuff there was something fulfilling about that as well yeah, yeah, those, those are the tough ones, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if how, you can answer this however you'd like, but what were some hardships you faced as station manager? I'm sure there were many, uh, but how did you surpass them? Well, I, I mean, the biggest thing was that we were always having to raise money. Mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely. We never knew um, from year to year. It was absolutely critical that we make our budget. And... I, you know, there were people that were working on that. That was their full-time job, but ultimately it was going to fall on my head if we were not successful. And so 
one of the, the best parts about that was that it put us in touch with, with the community. Uh, community outreach became something that I also was responsible for. So it gave me an opportunity to really learn about so many different organizations. I had the opportunity to serve on many boards in the community, work alongside these folks and figure out what they needed and how we could help them. And the better job that we did in serving the community, then the better the support became. Right. You know, mm-hmm. That's the so key. that that was always my goal was to integrate um, the community and KAMU as an interwoven part of that. Okay. So that when people thought about um, radio or anything else, the first thing that was going to come to their mind was KAMU FM. Yeah. And sure, yeah, that, that's, we're, we're still trying to do that. Yeah, yeah. it's still a progress. <laughs> well, it's always a work in progress. Yeah. And, and there's so, the community's grown so much mm-hmm. over the last several years. Mm-hmm. And so trying to get the word out to let people know that, that you're here and that you're willing to serve in the ways and the areas that you can, can assist, is it's a tough job. It really is because along with you, there's so many others oh yeah you know so it's mm-hmm. how do you put yourself on top and separate yourself from the mass definitely well well penny zent thank you so much i wish to someday have the impact that you have had on our community um but yeah thanks again keep working at it hector you just have to, to have longevity <laughs> <laughs> yes. thank you so much and now to close off the show, we will be listening to a song by our very own Fighting Texas Aggie Band. This is Maroon Tattoo from the Centennial album, composed by Joe T. Haney. I'm Hector Nino, and you've been listening to The Heart of Art, a production of 90.9 KAMU-FM. You can find all of our shows anytime at kamu.tamu.edu.
The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu.